Lecture 5, Transaction Costs in Soviet Society. We pick up our overview of Soviet history in 1985, as Mikhail Gorbachev took over leadership of the Communist Party. Gorbachev's mentor, Yuri Andropov, had succeeded Brezhnev, and he used the brief time before his death to dismantle Brezhnev's network of corruption and to begin turning leadership within the party to a younger generation, Gorbachev being his particular protege. Konstantin Chernyenko was Andropov's rival, but he followed him in office, and he derailed the anti-corruption investigations, but did continue to promote Gorbachev. By the time Chernyenko died in March 1985, Gorbachev had amassed sufficient influence within the Politburo to assume leadership unopposed. He inherited an extremely problematic situation. The economy, depending on which estimates we choose, was either stagnating or actually falling into negative growth rates. World oil prices had dropped to pre-OPEC levels, eliminating the cash infusion that had hidden economic dysfunction and financed imports of grain and technology. The military was mired in Afghanistan, and public discontent with the war was growing. In terms of our three-legged stool analogy, it would not be inaccurate to say that the institutional structure was wobbly. The weaknesses in the economic and moral cultural legs very evident, and the situation in Afghanistan even hinting at some cracks in the political legal leg. Gorbachev was neither unaware nor unprepared for the problems he faced. He quickly initiated the two policies we've come to know as glasnost, a political opening, and perestroika, or economic restructuring. Glasnost in many ways reflected the new, younger, educated face of the Communist Party. Unlike all his predecessors except Lenin, Gorbachev was university educated. Well read and thoughtful, he seemed unthreatened by dialogue, discussion, and even open debate. He ended the restriction of political office to members of the Communist Party and released thousands of political prisoners and dissidents from Soviet jails, mental hospitals, and gulags, a policy symbolized by inviting exiled Nobel laureate Alexander Solzhenitsyn to return to his homeland. Gorbachev also allowed, in fact, he even encouraged, social science research, including things like opinion polls, on previously hidden Soviet social problems like alcoholism and drug abuse. And his loosening of controls on the media meant that more discussion moved into the open. Increased freedom of speech in the press meant that knowledge of problems the Communist Party had denied or covered up, like poor quality housing, outdated factories, shoddy products, shortages, corruption, and pollution, spread among the populace, breeding increasing discontent. The jokes took on a sharper edge, and open protest was no longer unthinkable. As Glasnost reduced internal political repression, its effects became more and more obvious in the satellite countries of Eastern Europe. The Brezhnev doctrine of interference in the internal affairs of Warsaw Pact countries was repudiated in 1989, and the dominoes began to topple. By 1991, the Berlin Wall had fallen, and the communist governments of Bulgaria, Romania, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, and Poland had been brought down. Internally, there was also ethnic tension and nationalist upheaval within the Soviet republics themselves. If the worsening economic conditions weren't the primary cause of discontent, they certainly exacerbated it. Gorbachev openly acknowledged the need for reforms and initiated perestroika, or restructuring, experiments that loosened control over production. Basically, his answer to the faltering economy was to move away from strict centralization by devolving some of the control to provincial, regional, and even local levels. He hoped that this would streamline economic decision-making 
and eliminate the resource bottlenecks that plagued the system. His most radical reform was the 1988 Law of Cooperatives, which permitted private businesses, although operating as cooperatives, in the service sectors, in some types of light manufacturing, and in foreign trade. Restaurants, small shops, and consumer industries began to appear in the cities. A major reform, but one doomed to failure. The new cooperative struggled because Gorbachev didn't change the fundamental rules of the game. Price controls, lack of private property, and government ownership of most of the means of production continued to impose severe constraints. The new businesses had to form their own supplier relationships outside the traditional allocation system, adding a whole new source of production bottlenecks. By 1990, an increasing number of them were unprofitable needing subsidies, which added a huge burden to government spending at a time when government revenue was declining. The terms evil empire and Star Wars remind us of another source of pressure that weakened both the economic and political legal institutions of the Soviet Union, U.S. President Ronald Reagan. Gorbachev assumed leadership of the USSR in the middle of Reagan's presidency, a presidency characterized by unabashed criticism of what he called the evil empire. And Reagan did more than talk, adopting a consistent policy of challenging the USSR by upping the ante in the Cold War arms race, beginning with his proposal to create a space-based missile defense system that became colloquially known as Star Wars. Gorbachev recognized Reagan as a formidable foe, and that Reagan's defensive initiatives certainly had offensive implications. He also knew that the economic stagnation and lack of innovations in the 70s and early 80s had done more than feed consumer discontent. The mighty Soviet military was stretched to the breaking point and trailing disastrously in the arms and technology races. Gorbachev determined to answer the challenge funneling 27% of Soviet GDP into the military and away from consumer production. With those pressures, Perestroika failed to jumpstart the beleaguered economy, and the failure increased popular discontent. As the 80s drew to a close, not only the satellite nations of the Warsaw Pact, but the republics within the USSR began to declare their national sovereignty. Gorbachev also faced growing opposition within the party structure. So he proposed to reorganize the USSR as a federation of independent republics with a common president, foreign policy, and military, thus preserving the Communist Party's control over the economy. But in the end, he couldn't overcome opposition within the party from more radical reformers who wanted greater economic change and from conservatives and the military who feared weakening of the party's power. To prevent signing of the agreement creating the new Russian Federation, senior Communist Party officials put Gorbachev under house arrest, announcing that he'd gone on vacation. They quickly reimposed censorship and suspended all political activity. When Boris Yeltsin, president of the Republic of Russia, condemned the takeover, the coup leaders sent troops to surround the Russian State House, ironically known as the White House. Events would prove, however, that they didn't have full support of the rank and file in the army. In fact, some commentators have suggested that the troops didn't seem to know why they were rolling into Moscow and surrounding the provincial legislature. They certainly weren't predisposed to fire on the citizens who ran out to greet them with flowers. Additionally, the coup leaders failed to muzzle the media, and Yeltsin used it effectively. Striding from the White House, he climbed aboard a tank and gave a rousing speech, declaring Russia free and independent, an iconic image that was broadcast throughout the country by the dissident media. The tanks and troops turned their guns away from the White House, and the coup was over. Gorbachev returned to the capital, but he had little power as the governments of the republic paid no heed to the party's decrees. 
in December 1991, the Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian republics declared the Soviet Union dissolved and replaced by the Commonwealth of Independent States. By December 31, 1991, all official Soviet institutions had ceased to exist. It was over. As you can see from our stool metaphor, and as we've indicated throughout the course, we don't believe that the collapse of the Soviet Union can be explained as simply an economic failure. Writing in Resurrection, New York Times author and reporter David Remnick notes that Gorbachev's own economic advisors, interviewed after the fall, acknowledged the weaknesses of the economy, but denied that the circumstances were dire, estimating that they had another decade or more to incorporate reforms and prevent economic collapse. And the evidence, 70 plus years of lumbering along, suggests that they could very well have been right. Which leaves us with, then why 1991? And the most plausible story seems to be that the Soviet Union collapsed only when popular support of and belief in the system and its promises dissipated. And the political, legal, and especially the moral cultural institutions could no longer compensate for the weaknesses in the economy. In an interview with a Soviet military officer, David Remnick found insights into the depths of Soviet citizens' disillusionment by the 1990s. In 1940, under Stalin's orders, the Soviet secret police, the NKVD, perpetrated what is now known as the Katyn Forest Massacre of 22,000 Polish prisoners of war. Of the 22,000, only about 8,000 were professional Polish military. The rest, doctors, lawyers, professors, police, and other public servants, who, as holders of university degrees, had been required by Polish law to enter the Reserve Officer Corps. Polish inquiries after the war were met with denials by the Soviets, who blamed the Nazis for the atrocity and claimed no knowledge of the whereabouts of the mass graves. As part of Glasnost, Gorbachev issued an admission in 1990 and offered assistance to the Polish government in recovering their citizens' remains. Colonel Aleksander Tretetsky, a career soldier with a long record of service to the Soviet Union, including stints in East Germany and the invasion of Prague, saw his passion for the system disintegrate as he helped uncover the mass graves. Disillusioned, he told Remnick, I was dumb. I believed it all. I would have given my life for the motherland on a moment's notice. The unspoken implication, but not anymore. The moral cultural leg splintered and broke, and the institutional foundation of the Soviet Union crumbled. With the events of the Gorbachev era as background, let's return to our examination of Soviet society, where we've progressed from the leadership at the top, through the bureaucracy, to the level of production in factories and on farms. In this last lesson, we want to look at the Soviet households. Certainly, life in the USSR in 1990 was better than it had been, so we need an answer to the question of why buy-in that had lasted through the hardship of two world wars and 70 years of repression disintegrated so quickly in relatively better times. From the perspective of hindsight, we can identify three events that contributed major blows to the moral cultural leg of the system. First, the continuing pressure of the Reagan presidency and U.S. technological advance. Second, the war in Afghanistan. And third, the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. Ronald Reagan's relentless denunciation of the immorality of communism challenged the detente bred message that communism was just another way of organizing life. And, as the Soviet people gained access to media and communication technology through Glasnost, they heard that message, and they also learned of the comforts of Western life 
that the communist government could no longer effectively hide from them. The Communist Party began to reap an unforeseen consequence of Stalin's decision to educate the people. They had learned how to question and reason and evaluate, and increasingly the Soviet system was coming up lacking. And if one had still not been certain that the Soviet system was falling drastically behind, the decade-long conflict in Afghanistan tipped the scales. The protracted war showed the Soviet military to be ill-equipped, poorly armed, and completely incapable of taking down the ragtag Afghani rebellion. Whispers of defeat in Afghanistan and in the Cold War may have caused the Soviets to question their government's competence, but Chernobyl suggested a degree of indifference to citizens' well-being that made them question the regime's underlying beliefs. The explosion of the nuclear reactor was certainly cause for concern, but nuclear energy was a known risk, and even the United States had recently suffered a nuclear accident at Three Mile Island. So it wasn't the accident itself, but the response of the Soviet government that proved so shattering. Glossing over unpleasant details, denying failure, and presenting an image of success were well-known and tolerated Soviet propaganda strategies. But increasing numbers of citizens found the non-action after Chernobyl unacceptable. For the first 37 hours after the explosion, the government did nothing more than send in under-equipped firemen whose boots melted to the reactor floor. Offers of help from the West were declined amidst claims that all was under control and there was no health risk. Evacuations proceeded slowly. There were no limits on sale or consumption of fresh foods grown in the area. Few preventive medications were distributed. Disillusionment with the Soviet government spread with the news and images of the devastation at Chernobyl. While the big events like Star Wars and Afghanistan and Chernobyl critically eroded support for the system, economic analysis helps us uncover smaller cracks that made the system vulnerable to those major assaults in the first place. The smaller cracks were the consequence of the communist leader's original choice that the economy of the Soviet Union would be centrally directed. A banner at a May Day celebration in Moscow in 1989 read, 72 years on the road to nowhere. And even on the road to nowhere, you had to wait. Life in the USSR in the 80s was about lines. Lines for shoddy products, for planes, buses, and trains that didn't run on schedule. Month, year, or even decade-long waits for apartments, cars, and repair services and mazes of red tape and corruption. Lines and waiting are costs, transaction costs in economic terms. And in the 1980s, they had become an overwhelming burden on everyday life. Transactions costs are non-monetary costs that are not captured in an exchange. Now, that sounds complicated, but it really isn't. When you purchase something with money, your cost is represented by the money you pay. Money that you could have used for other things, but that you were willing to give up because of the benefits that you anticipate. You pay for gas at the gas station only because you anticipate that the benefit you receive will be worth the cost. And the same goes for the gas station owner. His cost is the gasoline you take a cost he's willing to bear because of the benefit he receives in the form of the money you pay that he can spend for things he values. Your cost becomes his benefit. Your benefit is his cost. In markets, you get a neat exchange of benefits and costs in a transaction. But suppose you have to wait in line to buy gasoline. Surely that's a cost for you. But is it a benefit for the station owner? No. He'd get the same benefit if you didn't have to wait in line. In fact, 
maybe in the long run he'd get more benefit because if the lines persist or are too long, you'll start going somewhere else for gas, somewhere with shorter lines that don't cost you so much time. The transaction cost, the waiting in line part, is therefore called a dead weight cost, meaning that neither party in the exchange benefits from the other bearing that cost. Another example of transaction cost is searching. You're looking for a specific part to repair your car, or you're trying to find the best deal in town on new tires. If you have to drive all over the place or call 20 parts shops, you bear a cost, a transaction cost that the seller doesn't benefit from. He'd get the same benefit if his shop was right next door to your work and you walked in and got what you wanted on your lunch break. So, it should occur to you that if the seller doesn't benefit from the transaction cost and in fact stands to lose from them, he has an incentive to eliminate them, to try to get you into his shop instead of into someone else's. Good thinking. That's definitely true if what? If the seller is motivated by profit. He knows that if his consumers can find him, get to him easily, and buy from him without lots of hassle, he'll have more customers, sell more, and make more profit. So, it shouldn't be surprising that market economies generate innovations designed to reduce transaction costs. From something as simple as adding another gas pump or allowing people to pump their own gas, to radio, billboard, and TV advertising, to the very first drive through window at McDonald's, to today's paying your bills online, sellers and markets have an incentive to find ways to reduce transaction costs for their customers. But not in the Soviet Union where the legal sellers weren't entrepreneurs and weren't motivated by profit. Um, we'll talk about the not-so-legal sellers in a minute. So think back to what you know about supply and demand. What happens when demand outstrips supply, when people want to purchase more than is available? The price goes up, right? Because when we say the amount that people want to purchase, the unstated part of that is if the price is right. And one of the ways to match the number of purchasers with the amount for sale is to let the price rise. So that some people say, oh, I didn't want it that much. We have long lines at the gas station, prices go up, and some people get out of line or don't get into line as often, choosing to ride the bus or commute with a coworker. Okay, so how could that work in the Soviet Union? Well, it couldn't. The prices were administered and they didn't change. Remember, we said literally sometimes not for decades. But there still had to be some sort of allocation mechanism because there was less available of almost everything than people wanted. The allocation mechanism in the Soviet Union wasn't price. It was first come, first served, or time in line. The true cost of purchasing things was the money price plus the time spent in line. By the 1980s, line standing was a way of life in the USSR, and the culture had even adapted to that necessity. For example, in a state store that sold several types of things, People could be in more than one line at a time. Different lines moved at different speeds, and over time, a system of holding places evolved. You'd claim your place in the slowest line, go over to make your purchase in a faster line, and then return to the slower line. And in return, you'd hold places for other people entering the line. A line standard role evolved in families, the elderly, or disabled doing the waiting while other family members worked. A necessary role in an economy where, by some journalists' estimates, the average citizen spent up to nine hours a week in line. Can you even imagine? Well, actually, you should be able to imagine. 
We've said that sellers in market economies have an incentive to reduce transaction costs, and that's true, usually. But that doesn't mean that there are no transaction costs in markets. Sometimes they occur because the entrepreneurs are caught off guard. Think of the surprise must-have Christmas toy that producers didn't anticipate, and the lines of frenzied shoppers when a store receives a new shipment. I guess we could call those accidental transaction costs. And we do know that behind the scenes, the producers are scrambling to meet the demand, something that didn't happen in the USSR. We also have to admit that, strange as it may seem, we do have instances when sellers in markets want people to bear transaction costs. Why, for instance, do people sometimes wait in line, even camping out overnight, for the chance to buy concert tickets? Doesn't it occur to you that if there are that many people who want the tickets, I mean, those concerts sometimes sell out in minutes, that the producers could just raise the price and still fill all the seats? Well, the key here is the relative opportunity costs of spending time or money to different groups of consumers. One explanation for not raising the ticket prices is that the younger concert goers who have a lower opportunity cost of spending time and a higher opportunity cost of spending money, will be priced out of the market. And they're the long-term customers who continue to buy the band's music and the promotional products at the concert venues. Older, wealthier customers, think people who work, have a lower opportunity cost to spending money and a higher opportunity cost to spending time. So they're less likely to stand in line. But since they're also less likely to buy the collateral products, the concert promoter is willing to forego the higher price they'd pay. The point being merely that we're not claiming that markets make transaction costs disappear, only that there are stronger incentives for sellers to reduce them in markets than in centrally planned economies. I also don't want to leave the impression that there were no incentives at all to reduce transaction costs in the Soviet Union. There were, in fact, very strong incentives. But unlike in market economies, they affected the behavior of consumers more than that of producers. Essentially, high transaction costs in the USSR spawned secondary markets, some legal, some not. Friends and neighbors, for example, engaged in kinds of informal markets. Part of the culture of line standing was that people never left home without a string bag in their pockets because they never knew when they might run across something for sale, which you could tell, by the way, because there was a line. And the practice was that if you saw a line, you got into it. And then you asked what it was for. A line meant something valuable. And even if you didn't want or need it, you'd know someone who did through your informal network of trading and swapping. Also important, though, and especially in terms of our thesis about the decaying moral cultural atmosphere, were the illegal secondary markets, the black or gray markets, as we might call them. The Soviets called it nelevo, on the left. People reduced the transaction costs that dominated their lives by avoiding the state stores whenever they could. By the late 1980s, nearly 35% of all commercial transactions took place outside the official economy. This was possible because in a system where everybody owns it, workplace theft was endemic. Remember, one of the readings in the Lesson 3 assignments even suggests that access to workplace supplies and products was an expected, though unstated, feature of laborers' wages, both by the workers and by factory managers. As production bottlenecks increased, transaction costs in legal exchange increased. People lowered those transaction costs through informal and illegal exchange. Petrol stations, for example, rarely had gasoline, so you got it outside the city on the ring highway, out of a barrel on the back of a pickup truck, or perhaps pumped directly from a military tanker. There was nothing on the shelf at the butcher counter, 
but you could buy it from the butcher at the back door. Buying on the left was a way of life, and perhaps the only way to make a life in the last years of the Soviet Union. To some extent, that's why we hesitated to use the term black market in describing this extra-legal economy. Nelevo was a common and accepted practice, even by the officialdom, who had no incentive to stop it and every incentive to look the other way. And as an accepted practice, it certainly carried none of the sigma we'd associate with the term black market. You certainly wouldn't proudly show off your latest black market acquisition in the lounge at work. But there was no shame in the Soviet Union in buying Nelevo. It's what you had to do, what everyone did. The corruption, the winking disregard for the system both by citizens and government officials, and the lack of a rule of law took its toll, opening up the internal cracks in the moral cultural leg and rendering it too weak to withstand severe blows like that administered by Chernobyl. So in 1991, the edifice crumbled, and the Soviet Union, as we'd known it for most of the 20th century, ceased to exist. Writing in The Fatal Conceit, Austrian economist and Nobel laureate Friedrich Hayek described the curious task of economics as demonstrating to men how little they actually know about what they imagine they can design. He went on to explain how the 70-year history of communism and socialism demonstrated the naive folly of conceiving of order as being the product of deliberate arrangement. He further explained that the failure of communism proved the superiority of decentralized organization in achieving social well-being. Hayek understood how centralized planning could be appealing, but he insisted that we acknowledge the impossibility of its promise ever being realized. Writing in 1988 as the Soviet Union was disintegrating, he offered us the ultimate lesson of the Soviet experience. And we'll close these lessons with his insights on the failure of socialism and the power of the economic way of thinking. Before the obvious economic failure of Eastern European socialism, it was widely thought that a centrally planned economy would deliver not only social justice, but also a more efficient use of economic resources. This notion appears eminently sensible at first glance, but it proves to overlook the fact that the totality of resources that one could employ in such a plan is simply not knowable to anybody, and therefore can hardly be centrally controlled. Economic analysis can elucidate the usefulness of practices heretofore thought to be right, usefulness from the perspective of any philosophy that looks unfavorably on the human suffering and death that would follow the collapse of our civilization. It is a betrayal of concern for others, then, to theorize about the just society without carefully considering the economic consequences of implementing such views.